body's need for speed I can put our wings in the wind faster than you could ever believe Why you ready to rock? Fun that don't ever stop We are on a crash course of freedom is running on as long as we want Hi, my name is David Wentworth Small. I am the co-founder of a company called Clarity Park. I'm also the author of a book called Selling the Cow, which focuses on the five pillars of disruption. And what got you into business? Well, you know, it's, it's, it's quite the story, but when it comes to, I've spent years as a consultant working for a number of different companies. And I've worked as a programmer, I've worked as a developer, and I worked as a SOA architect. And so eventually I began to launch out. And part of the reason why I launched out is because you get to a certain point where you're doing a lot of things for companies and you just have a vision, which is different than their vision. And you also realize that a lot of these companies that you're working for are probably not going to be around, at least within the same form that they exist now within the next four to five years. And so right. it was really my focus on disruptive technologies that caused me to say, you know what? A lot of these large companies, they're disasters waiting to happen. I've got to get out of here and begin to build my own. So you became a programmer slash developer when back in, were you, were you, did you actually go to school for it or did it become a more of a mentorship program? Well, you know, for myself, well, I'm an old guy. So I started way back in the 90s. But originally when I started off in terms of schooling, I actually started off in journalism. And oh, you know, yeah. there was, oh yeah, and uh, I, I was in Toronto at the time, and uh, I loved the creative arts, and I had some people, you know, the old joke they used to say, well, "What's the difference between a journalist and a medium-sized pizza?" You know, and a medium-sized pizza feeds a family of four, and so <laughs> <laughs> you know that was their way of saying, you know what, you really need to consider something that you can, you know, do as a viable type of tool or trade. So. Right. To make it long for a short, I ended up diving into technology. I went to an, you know, an IBM type of uh, setup school, a training facility they had. And, you know, they looked at my background. I had a lot of great academic credentials, but they said, you know what, you, you don't look like a programmer guy. You're like, you haven't really studied a lot of math, haven't really studied a lot of, you know, uh, uh, science in terms of your background. And so I convinced them, hey, look, you got to put me in here and I'll do all these things and I'm really good at learning, whatever. And I got in. And when I got into that program, eventually I started working in, um, I worked for a startup company in Toronto and we worked with some of the major banks. And the people that I met were some of the, you know, the, 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 the top people in the industry actually. And they really began to give me an understanding. Everything I learned in school, it, once I started working in the real world, it was a totally different environment. Right. And you know, there are some basic things you take over, but in terms of time period, you know, these guys had a startup that was founded by a gentleman by the name of Ross Perot. So it was a joint union between Ross Perot and IBM in the middle of downtown Toronto in the 90s. Right. And so the amount of people that you work with and the consultants that I work with, they began to give me some advice. And, so, you know, some of these guys were very, very senior IBM people. Right. And, as they gave, and as they gave me advice, you know, their advice was, listen, you need to focus on working for yourself you need to focus on work as a consultant do not become an employee don't get caught up in the tax brackets don't allow them to do that to you and you know basically they said you know create and own your own technology that's what you need to do and so that's what really began to inspire me on my journey from a technology standpoint so with that in back of your head the whole time what did you think was going to be your venture in technology you know pretty much especially for the era I came from, you work, you make money, you retire. That's it. Right. Once you've made your money, you go to a company, the larger the company, the better. Uh, in terms of the infrastructure, you know, a lot of the tools that they have in these corporate organizations, they're not even teaching in school. If you talk about Oracle, you talk about SAP, you'd be very hard pressed to find a university that actually has anything remotely dealing with those technologies. And so when it comes to it from a corporate level, you know, majority of these guys, some of these guys, I mean, I've met, some Oracle consultants that their probably billing rate is about 450 an hour. So basically, you know, if you're a young guy, you get caught up in this industry and you're making money. You know, most people say, Hey, buy your houses, buy your Toronto real estate, retire. That's what you do. But I think for myself, you know, I mean, I was never really focused on simply making money. 
you know, I just want to go earn a living. I have more of a humanity aspect to myself that I'm focused on. So I think yeah. that began to shape my narrative, right? I mean, it's a whole thought, like you make a lot of money, but everyone around you is going to die, all right? <laughs> Yeah, it's living forever, Paul. Theory, right? Um, going up against the big companies, did you were you concerned about getting one of your ideas or one of your products off the ground because of that? Was that a um, something that that you weren't sure that if you were going to go up against them, they were just going to buy you out, or there was going to be some sort of retribution? You know, no, it, it's actually the opposite. Working with large Fortune five hundred organizations actually caused me to have more of a confidence in terms of making a decision to become a competitor. And, you know, obviously I can't go into some of the organizations that I worked for, but, you know, one of them was a financial institution and they had me work as a futurist. And so a lot of what I was doing was evaluating future technologies. And I realized that, you know, I had a conversation with uh, the top CIO who was the director. This company is probably 38th in the world in terms of income, very huge. They have billions of dollars under management assets. And I talked to the director and I said to him, I said, listen, I said, I want to ask you a simple question. Are you a technology company or are you a financial company? And, you know, he laughed at that question. He said, oh, we're a financial company. This is what we do. And he didn't understand the premise. Mm -hmm. And the basic premise was you don't understand, especially for someone like myself that was studying out the future of the company, studying out Bitcoin, studying out some smaller companies, four guys who created a startup that became their competitor within five years. I said, you don't understand the basic premise that finances is changing. It's changed dramatically. The way we view money, the way we perceive money, you know, uh, there is so much money in the earth right now. The amount of capital that's available is, is, is you go to Europe, they have you know, zero interest loans. You look at some of the things that the Federal Reserve has been doing. They've introduced quantitative easing, but the Federal Reserve itself during the coronavirus started investing directly with an Apple and Tesla, right? And you say, oh my right. gosh, Apple all of a sudden became a $2 trillion uh, value valuation company during the midst of a, of a great crisis. Wow, yeah. people really must love Apple products. <laughs> <laughs> How are all these people that are unemployed waiting for a government check buying their Mac laptops, right? Right. And it's fun, right? If you study out what the Japanese have done in terms of quantitative easing, it really changed the whole economy of Japan. But the whole industry itself became dependent upon the government. And so now it, 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 it's just a different scenario. And so when it comes to it, dealing with some of these large companies, looking at how they operate, I realized a lot of these guys that were in charge, they were dinosaurs. They had been right. there so long. They had been functioning positions so long that they had no clue of what they were doing going forward in terms of their strategy. And talking to some of the top directors, it really, really gave me a clear vision to say, you know what, now's the time to get out the ship. Now's the time to build, even in terms of just from the base level. One of the things that I've always done is I've always focused on development. And I've studied management, I've did the whole PMI course, gone through these things and studied out Scrum, Agile, all these things, which are good. And I've always been asked by organizations, oh, you know what, we want you to focus full time on management. And I've always said no, that I will never make a conscious decision to divorce myself from the technology because right. the technology is moving at such a rapid pace. And my investment in the technology carries forward so much that that's the weight Management's important, strategy is important, but if you do not understand the technology, you do not understand how to leverage or manage that technology. And so that's what you have. And so, you know, when I, it comes to it in terms of the book that I authored, Song the Cow, The Principles of Disruption, you know, some of the things I put in there, and the reason I put it, it in there is because I wanted it to be a time capsule. I know that the products that I launch, the companies that I launch, you know, they have great value. But in terms of someone saying in the beginning, this is what I saw, this is what was happening, and this is why I believed it, that's why I want to encompass that within that writing. I mean, it's almost right. like there are times I go to bed at night and say, you know, I've got to write this thing. I've got to write it. You know, I've talked to right. other people and say, hey, listen, don't give away any secrets. Don't tell people what you're <laughs> doing, all these things. No. But I said, no, it's the opposite, right? I mean, the, the, the secret is not the knowledge. The secret is the source. 
And right. so you gotta, you gotta be careful. You might wind up missing one day. <laughs> yeah, you're, right. you're right. You're right. You're exactly right there. Right. I and mean, uh, there was actually, if you ever study out a rock band called iron butterfly and uh, you know, they had a bass guitarist who became an engineer and uh, you know, he said he came out in the nineties and he came out with this technology that was meant to read. It was called facial recognition. And yeah. so he had the time, he had a, he had a company he formed as crazy story. He formed a company with Randy Jackson, Michael Jackson's brother. Yeah. So they came out with this company and they were doing data on CDs at the time. And this guy came with the idea said, Hey, listen, we can do facial recognition. So this facial recognition, and this is in the nineties. So this facial recognition thing will be so big. And he told his family, he said, listen, if anything happens to me, <laughs> I did not kill myself. Right. <laughs> and I tell my friends all the time, right? My close friends that I talk to say, hey, listen, I have no suicidal thoughts. <laughs> right? Yeah. 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 I'm not writing a letter. It doesn't matter what happens, right? Like I have no plan. And so this guy told his family that, told his dad, and then he ended up some weird deal at an airport. And uh, he ended up uh, apparently, quote, quote, committing suicide, writing a letter saying, oh, the company, there was too much debt. I couldn't take it. I'm sorry. I had to leave. And the right. dad said, yeah, but he told us right before all this, and it just yeah. seems very odd. And he warned us that because he was working on this facial recognition technology, he was dabbling in areas that, you know, people were very, very leery about, right? Right. So, like I said, very yeah. interesting. That is very interesting. I never heard that story before. Um, <laughs> with, with tech development rates, though, from when you started in, in the industry, till now obviously it's pursuing a lot faster than it was 10 15 years ago but is there technology that you see that that is kind of right in front of us but is something that will probably be diminishing in the next five years or so oh yes oh yes you know when it comes to it i mean it's you know from a again right you have different aspects of technology so what it is you have, you know, from I want to ask you one specifically because there's there's a there's a topic that I've been talking about with a few people and and a uh, few that are in your industry and, and they feel this way, but specifically about emails and phone numbers. People mm -hmm. say that emails are something that will be going out. They don't think that emails will be something that will stick around for a while longer. Um, with all the new technology we have, like instant messaging and stuff like that, where we can send files and everything else. And then phone numbers, because everybody's been using now just online to talk to anybody. Um, do you feel that those two types of uh, industry, well, those two types of innovations are going to be something that we're going to have forever? Or do you feel that, well, I shouldn't say forever for anything, but do you feel that those two would be something that would die out eventually? Well, I, I think what will happen is the, the, the method of communication will, will definitely change. I think in terms of the first thing is, is like, you know, when it comes to that, people often forget that before you had email, you had the post office. Right. <laughs> the post office is probably the first form of disruption that needs to go in terms of right. how it's used, right? I mean, most people, you know, kids growing up today, they don't think of the post office. They think of Amazon deliveries. That's what they think about, right? Right, you do, right. right, right. <laughs> Yeah, and yeah. It's, yeah, right. But Amazon has done a better job at delivering packages than than you know the U.S. Postal Office, the U.S. Postal Service, right? And they've, they've exceeded that. They've made it their business. Amazon's not in the product, you know, business per se. You know, they're really in the delivery business because right. there's a lot of other people that can put the same products on their site, but they cannot offer the same distribution delivery as Amazon. And so when it comes to the post office, you know, you look at the post office. Why has the post office held on? Right? These these facts are critical. The post office stays because people feel a comfort in having the post office there, right? I know right. down in Canada, what did they do? They said, we're going to get rid of some of the rural area delivery services. People begin You're to right. freak out where you do yeah. that. That's my right, right? Tim Hortons yeah, called the rural delivery, right? You're going to change me. <laughs> <right>? <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, you're 100% nailed it right there. Exactly. And so if you look at the, the, the post office, you look at some of the factors, right? You take those same factors, you apply them to email. OK, mm -hmm. I have a friend of mine. OK, and he was, you know, he he has a mother. She was elderly. She passed away. And you know, before she passed away, guy came to her house and sold her email. Okay, <laughs> Guy came, said, hey, I have this thing called email. If you give me give our company twenty five dollars a month, we can set you up with this thing called. E and she had been paying this guy. And so, you know, her son comes one day. He's looking at her bill. Says, what the heck is Oh, I'm paying this thing called email. 
And, you know, you look at this and say, well, this is insane, right? But again, mm -hmm. so with the post office, people want the post office because there's a level of comfort. When it comes to email, even if the usage of email changes, even if the modes of email change, the problem is individuals do not necessarily change themselves unless they're forced to. Right. And so when it comes to the changing of email, what's going to change the changing of email? Well, it's going to be spam. Right? It's not going to be individuals have been given a new tool. This new tool is much better. No, because people are oftentimes leery of anything new. Right? right? They don't want to change the way that they operate. When it comes to our society and we look at the unemployment rate that we have, we say, well, there's no jobs. Okay, And that's the biggest lie. And I'll tell you why. I've never seen a classified ad that was empty. I've never right. picked up newspapers. Oh, no jobs today. Zero jobs. Check back again tomorrow. Right? Never happens. Right? <laughs> The reason why we have unemployment is because a lot of people do not like to change their job. They don't like to change their position. Oftentimes you talk to individuals and say, well, this is what I do. You know, I'm a mechanic. I work in an auto mechanic. And unless I can, well, you know what? There are electric cars out. Are you trained with it? Well, I don't like to work with electric cars. Okay, well, what are you going to do? You have to change your job. And people do not like change. And so when it comes to it, introducing new technology is, what not, is not really what I believe will force a change. It's when the old method becomes so decrepit. It's when the old method becomes so abused. And right now what you see is you see a lot of spam filters that are not doing their job. You see a lot right. of people inundated with, with email. And I, you know, one of the things I say, and, and we, we promote at Clarity Park, is zero email. Right? Keep your email box empty as possible because it's an important tool. And you right. want to be notified of something important. But the problem is when you get all the spam, and all these other things, it dilutes the whole purpose of email. And so you have a lot of people saying, you know what? I'm going to get rid of email when it becomes inconvenient for me. And so, yeah, right. I believe emails will go. When it comes to it, you mentioned another thing. You talked about cell phones, okay, in terms of phone numbers. Well, the first thing that needs to go from cell phones is a thing called voicemail. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Okay. And it's amazing, right? Because, you know, cell phone companies are still charging for this service, right? <laughs> They're still making money off of it. And, you know, yeah. there's all the people I know that have voicemail but do not use it, right? right? And when it comes to it, all these things, you know, they need to go. And when it comes to it, it's a matter of individuals, you know, that are willing, right? I think that when it comes to voicemail, it just sits there unused. Rarely do people check it. When they do check it, it becomes almost cumbersome. And so right. I know there's a lot of services that do, you know, um, little uh, – uh, the translation services they take the audio they transcribe it they send it to you but you know sometimes it gets messed up and the problem is when it comes to a message you cannot afford for a message to be miscommunicated something that's perhaps important and so when it comes to it, the, the main thing is from a society we need to move away from the usage of voicemail there needs right. to be something with individuals to say i'm not using voicemail if you call me you don't get a message just send me a text right? yeah. no voicemail right yeah and and again, right, what usually happens when I find this, and again, it's sad but true. As a developer, okay, it's not just that I was developing or working on code, but what I was doing was I was adopting a lifestyle with, that was different from that of the society. And so as a developer, I would do things or work with things that were about two to three years out. And so naturally, because you work in that environment, it makes you a futurist. Right. And so I don't use voicemail. I don't use email. I use a zero email policy and I avoid it at all costs. There's things that I do now. And again, right? I think that the rest of society will probably catch up in two, three years, but I think you're exactly on the mark. And in terms of the tools that facilitate it, it's not necessarily the tools, it's the lifestyle, it's the culture. It's when the lifestyle and culture begins to change. That's when individuals begin to change, right? I, I believe that 100%. Um, tech and jobs. Um, I was uh, watching this documentary about the actual amount of job loss within the last hundred years based on technology. And it's only been a handful, literally. There's probably actually only about 10 jobs that have actually been lost. Do you think that um, with job and technology going forward, with technology going forward, do you think that the adaption of jobs will still remain the same? It'll just be in a different technological field? Yes. I mean, you know, in terms of jobs and employment, it's almost like a river, right? The river never stops running. It just changes direction. And so, you know, we live in a generation where there's more opportunity than ever 
to be gainfully employed. But in terms of the employment, it now requires a strong skill set. And when it comes to it, there was a project manager back in the 70s by the name of Peter Drucker. Peter Drucker is one of the forefathers of project management. And one of the things that Peter Drucker said is he said in the future, and this is again, guy talking from the 70s, right? Rick James, Led Zeppelin, and Peter Drucker. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> he says in the future, there's going to be the knowledge worker. And workers are going to be employed like baseball players and athletes, where you're going to have individuals because of their specific knowledge that are going to command huge salaries. And so this is what he said in the 70s. And you have you know, governments that, you know, knew and, and took this to heart, but did nothing to prepare the people. And when it comes to it, you know, I remember years ago, I was talking to someone and they were you know, fairly educated, had some things going. But the problem is, is when you have a liberal arts degree and you're from uh, Minnesota, it doesn't really help in terms of the technology field. Right. And so you have a lot of people that have, you know, great degrees and, you know, some of the more liberal arts that can't function within the tech world. And I always said, you know, if you'll specialize, if you'll pick one area and you'll apply your reading knowledge, because you know, the main purpose of education is to educate yourself. That's what I believe. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, when I was younger, you know, I've actually had a story where I was horrible in school. Okay. And, you know, I was probably at one point the worst student ever. And there were people that believed that I was, you know, gifted. There are other people that believe the opposite, that this guy's an idiot. Right. And when it came to it, you know, there were some things I had to wrestle with as a kid. But once I wrestled with it, I mean, I went back to school and really just dominated. And at the end, they gave me awards as a student of the year. They did testing on me. And they said I was probably at the time ranked in the two percentile of testing. And I realized at the time, it didn't change. I changed. Right. And I began right. to understand some basic things regarding education, right? And, you know, some of the basic fallacies, right? So there are certain things I personally do not believe in when it comes to education. One of the things people talk about is they talk about IQ, Okay. They say, oh, you know, there's people that have great IQs. Now, if you take and you study it out, Malcolm Gladwell, a right, great author, right, yep. he did this study. Of, okay, let's take the study done regarding these kids with great IQs. Where did they end up? Most of them ended up doing nothing. Yeah. Okay. And what he studied, what he realized was he realized creativity. That if you find someone that's creative, someone that can construct different narratives, you know, on an instance, then this person is actually probably going to grow up and win a Nobel Peace Prize. Right. And so, you know, if you're young, you're taught, oh, you know what? You, you don't have a high IQ. You're dumb. Oh, look at this mm -hmm. guy. You're the class clown. There's no hope for you. You know, if you're taught that at a young age, then, you know, it comes, you know, the, I don't know if you know the tied elephant theory, if you ever heard that. No. So if you take an elephant, okay, from a young age, and you tie the elephant's leg around a pole, this is what they do. The elephant will not break free because when he's young, he tries, but he can't. As the elephant gets older, they don't need to change that rope to a chain. They leave that same rope on because in his mind, he could never break it. And this right. huge, big adult elephant is tied to a pole by a little string because in his mind, he set these limitations. And so that's what you have when it comes to our generation. You have individuals that are limited in terms of their mindset and their understanding. Because at a young age, they were told, you know what? You're good at poetry, so you need to be a writer. Right, <laughs> and right. because they've been taught this, you know, they did grade 10 math, okay? Which, you know, grade 10 math, the most horrible math class you can do, right? <laughs> That's where they introduce concepts you've never heard of. I mean, you do this, yeah. you're failing, you're grabbing your head. Why am I so stupid, right? There's a young kid across the classroom, you know? And this kid's just breezing through and they say, oh, you're just not good at math. Right, hundred percent. Tell you that you know the teacher was a bad teacher. They don't tell you that the teacher had a problem communicating. Yeah, because when it comes to it, a lot of education is about communicating. And how yeah. many poor communicators are there that sit within the school system every day because they passed or got certification somewhere else? But because they're poor communicators, as long as kids are doing well, despite them, they'll continue in that education system. Yeah, agreed, a hundred percent. Uh, I want to talk about your book. Can you let our listeners know what it is and why you wrote it, first of all? Uh, you know, and just to reiterate, you know, when I wrote this book, Selling the Cow, The Five Pillars of Disruption, it takes a scenario of Jack the Beanstalk. 
And Jack and the Beanstalk is a fable that most people are familiar with. Most people understand this basic fable. But it breaks it down and it looks at it to say, you know, what are the disruptive patterns that we find here? There's something more being communicated through this simple fable. I love studying history. I love, you know, uh, the basic premise of history itself because the, the beautiful thing about history versus the Kardashians is you can watch five episodes of the Kardashian that, you know, bring you no future currency. Right. But when you study history, you go back, study out China, study out the Taiping Rebellion. You know, these things carry forward in your life. And so we live in a generation that, you know, for the most part, does not study or think highly of history. Yeah. They you know, look back at people in the past and think, well, these guys are idiots. They didn't have iPhones. Look at them. They don't even know what Wi-Fi is. <laughs> right? Right, right. And they yep. have a very condescending view of history. But, you know, it's amazing, especially for myself, you know, when I'm traveling, you know, I'm in California talking to people or down in the East Coast or whatever. And so you know, talk to people, say, oh, I hate China. Uh, China is evil. I say, okay, well, wait a minute. Right? Oh, look at Hong Kong. I say, okay, well, the British own Hong Kong. And I ask them, do you know how the British acquired Hong Kong? They say, no. <laughs> I say, well, the British acquired Hong Kong because of the opium trade. Yep. You stayed out of of China. The Chinese did not want opium flowing into China. And there was a big war. And when the British won, right, it was the queen herself that, that, that launched the war, right, by edict of the queen, right? We must sell opium to the Chinese. Yep. And so, you know, when you have an understanding of history, it makes you a more balanced person to say, okay, wait a minute here. Okay, let's understand some things, right? When it comes to it, you know, the U.S. has a president. Canada has a prime minister. Okay, there are historical reasons why these factors are in place. And so when it comes to selling the cow, I said, okay, let me take, let me look at this previous generation because you know what? They did pretty well. They fought through right. some world wars. They survived. You know, some of these people that launched some of these companies, they became titans of the industry at some of the most, you know, horrible times in all of history. Yeah. And so when I began to look back at this, I realized that, you know, there's always been disruption in history. There's always been the, the, the toppling of great empires and and there's always been great companies that have fell and when it comes to disruption one of the basic principles i believe like we'll talk about amazon is a great company and you know i look at amazon say, okay well amazon's a good company i would never deny them but let's think where were all the other retailers when amazon was starting some yeah. of these retailers had millions of dollars at their disposal and i can tell you Having worked there for some of these large corporations, they totally missed it. And yeah. so when we talk about the greatness of Amazon, we never talk about the failures of Sears Roebuck. I'd right? argue we that they're still talk. missing it. Exactly. <laughs> we never talk about the failure of, you know, a Kmart, or yeah. we never talk about the failure of Walmart itself to really make an impact in right. that sphere. Yep. I agree and 100%. So, Exactly. And, and so when it comes to it, in terms of studying out, you know, disruption, what I did within Song the Cow is I looked at the five different pillars and said, what is it that causes someone to be a disruptor? What are the main factors? And, you know, taking those five pillars, you can apply it to any industry. You can apply it to any product, any service, a, any company, and you can look at it and say, you know what, okay, this is a disrupting factor. So let's take, because today is election day, Let's take the current U.S. election, okay? Now, the thing is, you know, I don't have U.S. citizenship, and, uh, you know, I'm a Canadian. So when I'm in the U.S., I get stopped a lot of times as a black man. I remember being stopped one time in Minnesota and say, hey, brother, you going to come vote? I said, no, 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 I can't vote. I said, why? I said, you have a criminal record? What's up, brother? We got to say, come talk to us. I said, no, 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 no. I said, I'm a Canadian. I said, oh, Canadian. I said, yeah, they got to figure it out. Okay, they got to process that you're Canadian. Okay. Yeah, but anyway, yeah, yeah. When it comes to it, in terms of the election itself, you know, regardless of the parties, you know, the main thing is, is disruption has been a main cornerstone going back from the Bush era. OK, so when Obama got elected, people elected Obama because they wanted something different. Right. When it comes to the popularity of Bernie Sanders, Bernie Sanders is popular because people want something different. When it comes to Trump. OK, Trump got elected in midst of the Republican Party. OK, because people wanted something different. And so what I believe is the failure of the Democratic Party is they always go for the tried and true. They're always going back to the old, right? They right. ran Hillary. We want to run Hillary. Why, why are you running Hillary? People want something. No, 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 we're going to run Hillary. Okay. 
900 million dollars later and a huge loss they realized maybe people don't want the old establishment that's what happens you know new elections come around they start running pete Buttigieg. they get bernie sanders or everyone's got to make their way up to the stage you even had a, a bloomberg coming up there he's got yeah. billions and everyone uh, and at the end they end up with joe biden you know, the guy's been in politics 47 years and so yeah. you look at it now it's like well the election's neck and neck and you're like okay <laughs> you're <laughs> neck and neck right? <laughs> How would that be? Well, you know, as much as people hate on Trump, I don't hate on Trump. You know, when it comes to it again, right? I'm looking at it as a prag pragmatist, okay? And as a okay. pragmatist, I'm, what did the guy do? What's happening? Okay, you got a lot of people say, Trump's a racist, Trump's a racist. Well, and I talked to someone, I think, within uh, two minutes, and I said, was he racist when he did The Apprentice? I've never heard him being called a racist until he became a Republican and started running. Right. <laughs> never heard that before, right? When he sat at the yeah. White House Correspondents' Dinner, never heard him described in that terms. And so when it comes to it, you know, the ability for this disruption in politics is something very critical. And there's a lot of people, unfortunately, that have been in politics for years. They don't understand it. And right. they cannot conceive what's happening around the world, why there's so much of a disruption in the political process. And again, when I wrote that book. I took five pillars. And you take those principles, you apply it. First thing it talks about in the five pillars is leadership. There's something about a human leader that we gravitate to. Doesn't matter how good of a system, doesn't matter how good of a product. When you have a leader in place, someone that understands people, it makes a huge difference. Right. And, you know, there's a lot of people that do not understand this basic principle, right? I'm glad that you brought up the leadership. Um, do you, um, when you're talking about leadership specifically in, um, I would say, uh, let, let's talk about smaller businesses with lower amount of employees. Um, when you get a leader that comes in and they are, um, I guess best term is a gauntlet leader. Somebody who, who really kind of pushes everybody down, doesn't build them up, really wants to more so get the the work out, the product out, rather than obviously the caring of the employees, the, the, the morale, whatever it is. Do you think that, um, when, when finding leaders in, in today's, I guess, demographic or today's, um, today's youth, there's a lot more, um, change that we as leaders have to take and understand than we did 10, 15 years ago, maybe even 20 years ago, where, approach is based on the person themselves and not based on the company. Um, different approaches need to be done on different people. Um, some people are, are more of a, a person where they can be kind of guided a little bit differently, maybe through, you know, a good stern talking to, but then that stern talking to would not affect, would, would react completely different to the next person. Oh, you know, yeah, well, you're exactly right. And just to expound upon it, when it comes to it, one of the things that I've dealt with when dealing with corporations is that a lot of people do not understand the diversity of leadership. A great leader will bring together individuals that are very diverse in nature because that leader understands how to deal with, as you stated, people individually. Like you got a leader, whether it's a man, whether it's a woman, whoever they are, when they're dealing with when they're dealing with a crowd. They deal with individual facets of the crowd. If they're in a small business and they're dealing with a group of employees, you got four employees, you know, you got the uh, latte drinking coming into late, uh, you know, uh, wannabe painter. You have the rough warehouse hand who's good and is aggressive, but doesn't like to talk much. You got all these people. A good leader has to understand these individuals and relate to them. And in the midst of that, these individuals may not even like each other but they all right. relate to each other through the, through the cause and purpose of the leader. And so, you know, a lot of people, unfortunately, in terms of business, do not understand this principle because of the financial aspect. You have individuals, right. you know, one of the things I talk about in Song of the Cause, I talk about nepotism. You have individuals that have been given money. Like some of these individuals, whether it's inherited money, whether it's friends or family, they're given money. And, you know, in our generation, there's sort of a power that comes through capitalism that, if you have money, you have finances, if you wear a big fancy watch, people immediately assign to you some type of authority in our system. Oh, look at that guy. 
I said, oh, that guy's a great guy. Oh, well, look at the car that he drives, right? You build a company, it doesn't matter how you built it. They just look at the end result. And, you know, the sad thing is, is that in that environment, you have individuals that they just care about the end result. They don't care about the individuals. They don't care about the people. And so when you have a leader, a leader says, you know what? It's not about me. It's not about what I can do. It's about what I can do for others. How can I help others? You know, I remember being at a company and we had one leader and this guy would sit at the board. When I came in as a consultant, you know, a very high level position, but I would be there at the board and he would start yelling at people and he would yell at the employees. Oh, you got, ah, yeah, blah, 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 you know, just yelling at them like kids. And I'm stunned, you know, because I'm the new guy. So I'm like, oh my gosh. I've, I've been on those phone calls before. I know exactly yeah. how they feel. <laughs> and, 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 you know, when you're there, you're looking at him yelling, but you're also looking at the people to say, okay, well, you're not responding. You're just sitting there taking it in. And it's right. almost like, well, you know, he is the boss and this and that. And so when I'm seeing this insanity, I'm thinking to myself, you know what? There are so many programs against mental health that we have, okay, within the U.S., within Canada, so many programs. And yet, you know, if you want to really deal with mental health, the first thing you need to do is a campaign that goes to companies. So if you have a boss that yells, call 1-800-YELLOW-BOSS, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because at the end of the day, I'm thinking these people are sitting here because, you know, they need their job, they're concerned about income. And they let this guy yell at them like kids. Like, that's got to affect you mentally when you go home to your spouse or your significant other or whoever, your it does. family. Right? It I does. mean, it's got to have an effect. And, you know, that same company was sad because, you know, I've seen people start crying. I've seen people start, you know, oh, and I've told them, look, it's not worth it. Like, no. it is not worth it. And so, again, right, when it comes to it, we have people in positions of leadership because of the, the financial aspect these guys need their job they're gonna to listen to this guy yell at them but as things begin to change and as doors begin to open right as finances and new avenues new doors open i believe a lot of these things that you know we're witnessing today okay are going to be things that you know five ten years 20 years in the future people are going to look back and say this was insanity right yeah, how did this I, I, I agree i actually know of two companies in the last year i'd say even maybe even less than a year where the CEO was told to resign because of his, um, I would say not really just his actions, but um, they they called him an old school leader. So they were, he was told, he was told that you know I, I the one specifically that I'm talking about was exactly like you you pointed. You know he would throw chairs around the office, he would fire people on the spot. But then we come into labor laws where you 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 can't do that anymore. Uh, you can't even do that ten years ago. But now they're becoming stricter on those labor laws where you you have to be if you're going to fire somebody, you need to do it of just cause, not because they screwed up your coffee or something stupid. But but he was so over the top. Like you want to talk about mental illness. Well, some of these owners or CEOs, they have mental illness. It's just a different kind. And it's causing them to be reactive on situations that d just are over the top. Yeah, you're right. And, and you know, part of the reason why that sometimes they maintain their power is because of result, which is, is it's sad, right? Because, you know, if you study is out the result uh, or is it fear? Well, it depends. If they're in a position where they have a you know, hierarchy, okay, that can yeah. fire them, right? And the hierarchy says, well, are they getting us results? Because if they're getting results, then the hierarchy tends to overlook some things, okay? Bobby Knight was right. one of the best basketball coaches ever, okay? And uh, Bobby Knight, you know, <laughs> as a coach, is probably one of the most controversial coaches because he used to do things. He used to, you know, very old school, right? Yeah. But again, right, in our shifting culture, Okay, people have become very sensitive towards some of these things and people are becoming more, I guess, acknowledging. And, you know, the problem with getting rid of Bobby Knight is it's hard to get rid of a winning Bobby Knight. And so, you know, I'm a true Leaf fan at heart. That's one of the badges that I take with me wherever I go. Okay, <laughs> traveling through Montreal as a Leaf fan is something, you know, you got to endure the pain. But, you know, it's funny because you look at Babcock and, you know, they got rid of Babcock. And one of the yeah. things they said, they said he wasn't really player friendly. And I said, you know what? That's because he's not winning. If Babcock yeah. had got them to a playoff berth, if he had got them to, you know, uh, the, the, to the Lord Stanley Cup, they would never fire him. Yeah. And so, you know, depending upon where the leader sits, if there's higher ups, you know, we live in a very capitalist society. 
And the way capitalism has dominated our society is insane. And we don't really see that until we see instances where you have someone in a position of power that is successful at what they do, but doing it in perhaps not the best manner. And when it comes to it, if they don't have a position of power, they don't have people over them that can fire them. It's just them by themselves. Then the reality is they'll just exist and they'll always have employees. Right. But what I found is they'll be usurped. In other words, at some point, you're going to have some other company, and I've seen this play out, that's hiring people doing the same thing that says, hey, you know, a good example probably is 37 Signals, right? Great company. Okay, You study out some of the writings, great things. But you, know, you have a company that says, hey, you know what? I can get people. I can do the same product or service, and I can treat these people like gold. And you know what? I can even give them incentive. There was a company back in the days called First Service. And I think it was a Canadian company. And one of the things they did, they would simply acquire companies. And all they yeah. would do is they would look at a company, they would acquire this company, and they would just treat the employees better. They would give them profit yeah. sharing, they'd give them incentives, and they would, and all of a sudden, magically, <laughs> the company would start to do better. I mean, it just yeah. break the records. And so when it comes to it, you know, the greatest incentive for people to do well is the productivity factor. You know, one of the things I say is that words are free, okay? If you as a leader cannot speak proper words to people, encouraging words, you know, guy screws up, messes up, you know, he's feeling like, you know, just crap, feeling like, ah, oh, you, know, uh, you know, as a leader, right, your words in the next few minutes are either going to make or break this guy. And he's right. got to go home to his family and he's got to, and what you say is going to have a great impact. So as a leader, if you cannot freely give the necessary words in critical times, then what is your purpose? You know, and especially when we talk about automation, AI, and replacement, right? I mean, great people, it's hard to replace great leaders when they've done well. But if you get a bad leader, it's just a matter of him screwing up once and he'll be gone. I agree. I agree. Uh, I do want to talk about your companies. I want to talk about your your current. Well, I wouldn't should say current, but the um, the scheduling app that you have created. Um, can you kind of tell our listeners a little bit about it? I don't want to go too much into it. I want to hear them to hear from you. Sure. So we created an online personal organizer called Clarity Park. It's an online. It's an app, and uh, what its basic purpose is is to help people be more organized. Now, when we created this app, we did it because we wanted to do something that was positive, something that would help individuals. And we realized, you know, the greatest need in our generation is for individuals to be organized. That's the greatest need. There are a lot of other opportunities I had to get involved with a lot of other companies. You know, and I think that uh, in terms of just the direction, I said, I myself, you know, I'm very at heart, you know, I, I, I have a heart for people. You know, I want to give individuals something that's going to help them. And help them to be productive. And that's why we created Clarity Park. But we understood too that people are not organized, you know, by nature. That, you know, human nature is very messy. You know, if we're left to ourselves, we just do anything we want, right? We're not very structured individuals. The sad thing about the education system in North America is that they take an individual from a young age and they give them a structure and they give them a structure all the way through, you know, elementary school, all the way through junior school, they don't really allow them to think about the structure for themselves. And by the time they hit college or university, they say, hey, you're on your own. Figure it out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Show up at these classes this time. Look, we've got some random timetable for you. Figure it out. <laughs> right? And so yeah. if, you, if you do research and studies, you find most individuals fail the first year of college or university. And they do horrible, not because they're bad students, but because they're unorganized. Right. They lack the ability to bring their own structure to their life. And, you know, I have uh, three beautiful daughters, okay, and two of them are about to enter into that university college phase. And so the discussions I have with them are amazing discussions. I have one daughter, I don't want to out her, but, you know, she mentioned she had a, she was given a lifestyle teacher, okay, and this teacher was supposed to help her like a guidance counselor. This guy yeah. comes in. He's 23 years old, says, I couldn't find a job. I was unemployed. I was in my parents' basement. A friend of mine works at the school, so he hooked me up with this job. So I'm going to help you kids to be successful in a world I couldn't be successful in. Yeah. <laughs> and to her, she's saying something wrong. Right. right. <laughs> you know, it, 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 it's interesting. But again, when it comes to being organized, when it comes to putting things in order, 
we began to create the app, but we also created the blog, blog.clarityofheart.com, and we began to release a lot of instructional tools. We have tools that we're coming out with that are instructional tools to help individuals to become more organized because to be an organized individual, you have to start by changing the way that you think. And so if you go to blog.clarityofheart.com, one of the things we have is we have the introduction, right? What is a master list? What does this mean? Well, a master list is when you take everything that you're responsible for, you write it all down on paper. Don't even use the app. And that's what our suggestion is. Write it on paper, figure out what is it I'm responsible for, what I need to do, and then start to organize it, put it into categories, and then start to keep track of it. Okay, have I done this? Have I done that? And so these are all things that we do through Clarity Park. And then the extension of that. So one of the things that we just did is we actually just released a press release today for an app that we'll be releasing in the App Store, which is called the Clarity Park Blood Pressure Journal. And so what this does is it helps individuals to keep track of their blood pressure. And one of the reasons why we did that, we tied it into the U.S. election. We said, you know, a lot of people with all that's going on right now, blood pressure is a a big issue. Okay, And so, you know, when it comes to media, media sometimes says things that are salacious in nature because they want to get stories, they want to get hits. That's, you know how it goes. Your job. Reading, yeah, you're reading medium articles. Why my boyfriend has you know um, two hearts or something like that. Oh gosh, what, what's yeah. going on? Right? That's that's how media yeah. is. So one of the things they did in the U.S. is start. Oh, a lot of black people are dying from Corona in the U.S. We've got to figure out why. And you know the misnomer is okay. The the, the melanin in your skin is not going to cause you to die from Corona, okay? What it is, it deals with blood pressure. That, right. And this is, you know, I think part of the failure. I I, I can go on a whole yeah. diatribe about, you know, <laughs> uh, the biggest thing I think about Corona is the failure of the governments to properly give the people the data to make the decisions they need. So right. it's a big right. So when it comes to it, if you study it out, if you have high blood pressure and you catch Corona, that's like a double negative. And because blood pressure affects your heart in a way that, you know, in terms of the arteries, when you catch corona, it is one of the biggest things that can contribute to a corona death. And so we release that blood pressure journal, you know, and hopefully it'll help people to be more conscious, especially people that are, are struggling with high blood pressure, to begin to make notes of your blood pressure, keep track of it so you can actually analyze it. And it also gives them the ability to share it with their physician if they so choose. Right. Interesting. Well, where did that i has that idea been in the works or is that something that you guys wanted to push out pretty quickly because of what's happening now not just with the election i mean but in in general with what the world is coming out to be well you know, you know what it's something we had in the works and again right for clarity park i love this company and it's something i created because i wanted it to be genuine right right if i were looking for money i would never do this if I was just simply focused on, I'm going to make a lot of profit, I'm going to do this, I'm going to position myself, I'd never do it. But again, right? I grew up in a very hard life, grew up in a very hard area. And when you grow up in that environment, you actually develop something called a love for people. Right? You actually say, you know what, what can I do to help people? Right? And right. you know, when it comes to the promoting of this blood pressure journal, we actually have a lot of other things we want to promote. But I said, you know what, if it'll help one person stay alive, then let's push it. Right? If it'll reach right. people, it'll help individuals to be more conscious. And again, right, even to counteract other narratives, right, to, to help us say, hey, listen, if you have high blood pressure, and you catch corona, then it's going to be really bad for you. And I don't think that's really being preached a lot or, or promoted a lot within the media to say, look, these things will affect you with corona. You know, when it came to the ventilators, perfect example. Okay, so we got to get ventilators. We need ventilators. Uh, we had uh, Governor Cuomo in New York. Oh, we need ventilators. We need ventilators. We're going to go production, okay? There were doctors that said, you know what, I've dealt with uh, airborne sicknesses and this ventilator thing's not a good idea. I think it's going to make it worse. And at the time, they were, they were, they were, they were, they were crucified in the media. How dare you say this? You're anti-corona. Yeah. How, you know, then this is a yeah. fully medical doctor working, okay, in the field, okay? First-hand experience is always the best experience. He sees this in patients. Turns out he was right. What do they do now? You never hear about ventilators. You never hear them say we were wrong. What they do now is they take the patients and apparently they turn them over on their stomachs because they find it's much better for them. Right. So, Instead of, yeah. It's, so yeah, it's I, unreal. Exactly. And, uh, and I think that there's a future generation that's going to look back at the media and some of the things and the ways that these things were handled and begin to analyze it in detail to see, you know, who was sincere, who was not. Right. 
Now, with our full talk about basically technology, um, your ads on your show or on your free for uh, Charity Park organization, it says that to remove yourself from technology. And that's wow. something that the that the, you you really promote where, you know, um, and it, I want to say that it's it's reassuring when I was watching the the ad because they were doing everything they wanted to do just without a cell phone or something in their hands. And I just want to kind of kind of go down that path with you and and talk about distancing yourself from technology at some point in your day. I, I I'm bad for it, but I'm not bad for it because I don't want one. I enjoy technology. Technology actually does benefit. Give me more time with my family. It gives me more time like you, an app is a prime example. An app for organization is something that I need for my own personal life because my life is busy. I, I am always busy doing something. I'm always on my phone, but that's because of my industry that I work in. And that's because I have to be available 24 seven, mm. but to have those moments where I go fishing, I go hunting, I go up the mountains with my kids or my family and my wife, uh, we go do things outside of just being attached to my phone. Your your that ad really kind of spoke to me because it's good to see that businesses in the technology field are taking that step to realize, hey, people need that moment to themselves. They need that moment to be able to just disengage from the technology side for a bit. No, you're right. Well, you know what? And, and I'll say this. And again, right, you know, for the company itself, you know, being based out of California, it's very interesting because there are people that I have to be very careful of in terms of the direction of the company and financing, because there are some people that I spoke to that said, you know, if you deal with these people, well, we won't deal with you. They were just very straightforward. Do you deal yeah, with these yeah. people? I have yeah. Nothing to do with you. I know these people are talking to you. But the main thing is to preserve the purity because you know, we're attempting to help individuals and not every company. And you got to remember, right? There are some companies that they make their profit <laughs> through keeping you addicted to their app. Oh, absolutely. They, Facebook. Right? Hmm. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Wow. Right. <laughs> and so what happens is, you know, we preach digital wellness. Okay. And we talk about, you know what, the purpose of the app is to release you. That's what we want to do. Now, the problem is, is some of these same companies that are promoting these other apps. Oh, we preach digital wellness too. We're going to help you. We're going to introduce screen time. And we're going to help you to spend. And the reality is it's sad. It, it's like going to your drug dealer to get a recommended um, rehab clinic. Right. <laughs> right. And that's the reality. Right. And so as a company, we have to divorce ourselves from certain people and certain practices so we can promote certain products. Right. And again, right, because the basic narrative and, you know, like you said, right. OK. And one of the narratives you have is that AI is coming. This AI is coming. It's so powerful. It's got to take over everything. Okay, Well, who's creating the AI? Right. Because even in the Terminator movies, there had to be somebody creating the AI. But yeah. there's something about a company that if I'm releasing a specific product that potentially can go off the road and kill someone, then I'm not going to say, yeah, my company created a product that went off the road and killed someone. I said, no, the AI did it. I can't right. believe that. <laughs> and yeah, so yeah. This, this, this desire to divorce and to present technology as somehow creating itself, right, that it, you're not responsible for it, right, that it's just taking over, right? That's the greatest thing a capitalist could, could, could ever desire. Right. right. And so, you know, you look at currently with uh, WhatsApp and, and some of the things that are taking place in terms of TikTok in China, right? Yeah. You know, the governments, right? Right now, I know the Trump put a ban out. Okay, that ban that he put out, right? And again, right, it was a very strong ban. And the reason why most people are, don't understand, well, why is he banning TikTok? Come on, it's just kids playing. The reason why is because, uh, you know, the company and some of their involvement around the world, they've been purchasing newspapers. And they've been purchasing papers because they want to understand in terms of stories and what to run in the algorithms and apply that same algorithms towards the media. Mm -hmm. And so at that point, that's why the US government steps in. This isn't just about kids dancing on a video anymore. This is something much greater. And when it comes to the personal individual, especially when it comes to children, right? You know, my kids, I do not want them on apps and I've tried to keep them away as much as I could from physical devices until they're older. Yeah. And the reason why I do that is because I understand that this technology is not healthy. Mm -hmm. People say, Oh, well, it's just cause you're old and you grew up and you know, but well, you had this, well, you know what? I actually, you know, I drank water from a hose. 
Okay. There's a generation, they've only drank bottled water all their life. They haven't drank water from a hose or even from a tap. Right. And uh, I used to go out and play at night, do all these things. I've had those things in my life. And because of that, when I now engage in technology, you know, like yourself, you made a statement about getting away. You understand, hey, I got to get away from this. Thing. But if you grow up and this is all you know, you just think, well, this is life. And you're going to miss out on the real purpose of life. I agree. And that's why we try to get our kids out in the nature as much as possible. Uh, we feel that they they definitely need it to to educate themselves and we need to educate them on basically the grassroots of, of who we are. Uh, we can't just, can't just hide behind devices all day long. Um, unfortunately, we don't know what's going to happen in 20 years, but at least for now we can kind of raise our kids a little bit, a little bit more off the grid a little bit. Oh, um, yeah. I want to kind of ask you to give a little bit of advice on what you would say to young entrepreneurs that are looking to get into the tech industry right now. You know, I'd say the best thing you can do is build a device that will help others. And it, it may seem simplistic in its nature, but if you're doing something that you want to help other people, and I believe, again, there's a curve coming. And part of that curve is that people are beginning to look with more of an open eye towards technology, what it does, what its end result, and what its purpose. And so if you start building on a bad foundation, if you build based upon popularity, I'm going to do something that's popular. I'm going to create an app that's popular. I'm going to do something that's trending. I've sat in a lot of meetings, different VCs, different people, individuals. And it's sad. It sounds like they can't think for themselves. You know, like following a template. This is what we do. This is what we were told to do. We were told this is popular, so this is what we do. Mm -hmm. Well, you know what? If you want to be effective in life, just find an area where you can help other individuals to be successful. Because there's a lot of individuals that are struggling in various areas of life. And if you build upon that, then you always have the reward of knowing that you've helped other individuals. And you'll always have a good conscience at the end of the day. There are people right. in Silicon Valley that have a bad name. They have a bad reputation. They've done things. They've committed acts. They've created things that they're not proud of. And because of that, you know, doesn't matter how much money you have in the world. You can't buy back your name. Right. I, I couldn't agree more. Couldn't agree more. Yeah. Uh, where can people find you? Oh, you know, if you want to find best place is uh, claritypark.com. Go register, download a copy of the app. Go to blog.claritypark.com. You can find us there. And, uh, you know, go there and uh, tie into what we're doing. We have a lot of great things coming out. When it comes to it, in terms of being a strong competitor in the field, we're looking to lead in terms of what we do. And I understand that it's very novel, but uh, yeah, I encourage you to tie into Clarity Park and uh, get a hold of what we're doing. And also in terms of the book, if you go to sellingthecow.com, you can go there. It has links to where you can pick up the book. I encourage you to pick up a copy of the book, give it to friends, give it to families. If you're a small business owner or a large business owner and you want your individuals within your organization to think in a way that's going to be disruptive. If you're trying to introduce leadership concepts, I encourage you to get a copy of this book. It's not just written by someone that sat behind an academic desk. It's written by someone that's worked in the field, currently working in the field, currently using these principles and seeing them play out in everyday life. 